this morning what we're going to do is we're going to get into our new topic. We've done uh, a couple different things so far. We've done Christian foundations and we've done personal ministry and now we're moving into apologetics. But before we get into the specifics of that, I want to do a little bit of um, overview again and uh, just kind of situate apologetics into the big picture of what we've been doing at the Leadership Initiative. So. Uh, this is kind of redundant. You guys have heard me do this before, but I, but I do want you to see how it all fits together in my head. So first off, uh, what we've talked about together um, over the first eight weeks of the Leadership Initiative were, the, were foundations. Uh, we, we did foundational things together, the different Christian doctrines, the different um, theology, uh, pieces of theology. And that's very important. It's called foundation because I think that it's so critical to everything else that we do. How you think about God, uh, the things that He has revealed to us in form and shape, the way that you do everything else. So it's, it's important that we understand things about God and things about humanity and things about the Holy Spirit and the church because all of those different pieces are going to really shape the way that you do ministry and you do apologetics and you do evangelism. Uh, I think that there's a couple that, that are going to have a kind of an exclamation point on them, a couple different doctrines that we've talked about. One of them would be the doctrine of mankind, the doctrine of man. Uh, because if, if you can remember, we talked about man being man and woman being made in the image of God. And, and w with that carries the notion of God's common grace. And so when we think about people, we need to remind ourselves that they were made in God's image, that they have dignity, that they have value, that they have worth. Uh, our friends who are unbelievers still have the, they still have the common grace of God. They still bear the mark of God. And so we can look at them and we can see very good things in their life and, and the doctrine of man informs us of that. It reminds us that God has made them in His image. And we should be able to notice and identify and praise those things in, in people's lives. And, and also, you know, the doctrine of sin helps us to understand everything that we're talking about. It helps us to recognize that, that, that everything that, that we do is marked by sin, uh, a, a tendency to turn away from God and turn to ourselves or to something else. And uh, we need to have both of those truths in mind as we engage in apologetics or as we engage in personal ministry. We need to, to recognize those things. You know, other, other doctrines that I think are important for the big picture are issues of salvation and how God works through His Son. Uh, and His Holy Spirit to, to bring salvation into a person's life. We need to know how that stuff works in order that we can do ministry in a way that's going to be aligned with reality. So, um, all those doctrines that we covered, I think are important for, for ministry, for life, for, for everything that we're doing here at the Leadership Initiative. Then what we've done over the past several weeks is we've done a section called personal ministry. And um, what, what we were talking about really was what are we trying to accomplish as we do ministry and how does that happen? And the answers to those questions were change. Okay, what, what, do, what, are, we trying, what are we trying to accomplish? Well, we are trying to accomplish people being changed or transformed into the image of Christ. And so we spent a few weeks just looking at the theology of change. How is it that Corey Williams becomes more like Christ? How is it that Michelle Brown even? How do we become more like Christ? And how do the people that we're talking to change into the image of the Son of God? And is that possible? And what does that look like? And so uh, we, we covered that. And then uh, answering the question of how does that happen, um, we really looked at the fact that it happens when you are used of God. God can use you as an instrument of change. And we used Paul Tripp's book, uh, Instruments in the Hands of the Redeemer, to kind of 
get our get our mind around that reality that change is possible and you're going to be an instrument of change in people's lives that as you do certain things personal ministry uh, people are going to be changed or transformed into the image of Christ and so we looked at some different characteristics of a good helper a good instrument of change and uh, we'll, we'll review a little bit of that in just a moment um, the number three um, is apologetics and that's the the new section that we're moving into currently okay and apologetics is really it's the idea of it's the the Greek idea of giving a defense um, so it's pre-evangelism. Okay, you've got people that you go to school with or you work with. They've got, we could put it this way, they've got obstacles in their way of them coming to faith. They've got questions. They've got um, ideas that are barriers to their faith in Christ. So, for instance, uh, some of you guys have friends in the public school who have been taught things about the world that we live in that are hindering them from believing in God. So there are obstacles in the way. Apologetics is um, the, the art of talking to people in a way that's going to remove some of those obstacles. It's going to get those barriers out of the way so that way people are able to come to faith. Uh, it's graciously defining and defending what we believe. And we're going to spend several weeks on apologetics starting this week. Number four, evangelism. That's our next section after this one. And that really is uh, proclaiming the gospel to people. Proclaiming the news um, you know, the, the biblical imagery is a herald. So the king has a message, and a herald, somebody who is doing evangelism, is telling people, I've got news. The king has said. The king has done this. And we're proclaiming that reality to people. But it's, it's even more than that. It's, it is inviting people to respond to those truths. So evangelism is uh, telling news, but doing it in a way where we're, we're asking them to respond to that news. The king has sent his son to forgive us of our sins and to give us the hope of new life. Believe in him. Respond to that reality and live in light of that. And then, you know, we could even say that there's, there's more to the big picture than just those four different sections that we um, are covering. We can also talk about discipleship. That's number five. And we don't have a section on that necessarily. I don't know what we'll do after we finish up apologetics and, uh, and evangelism. But discipleship would kind of be that next step. It's that um, idea of we don't just want people to believe Jesus and then we're done with them. We want them to grow and mature. And so it's kind of that long-range view. And really... Personal ministry can be discipleship. Um, you, you can use the, the different tools that hopefully I've been giving you in order to do discipleship with other believers as you talk to them and as you love them and as you ask them questions and get to know them. Those are all uh, marks of discipleship. So that's kind of that long-range view. Uh, now there are a couple different assignments um, and I just want to go over them quickly again. Number one, the being prepared assignment. And it comes from 1 Peter 3, 15. And it's really a, an assignment on apologetics. It's, uh, on the one hand, what I want you to do is I want you to write down what you believe about God, about faith, about whatever, whatever route you decide to take. Uh, I want you to write it in a way that is... Ordinary. So you could be talking to someone, for instance, you guys, I'm, I'm sure at the Y, work with other people who aren't Christians, right? Well, if you were talking to them, I, I would want the language to reflect them. So we're not using church terms, we're using just normal 
this is what I believe about God and uh, about life and and that's what I want you to do there but then part two is kind of giving the motivations and the reasoning behind why you believe that um, how many of you guys are having intentions of doing these different assignments okay a few of you I think it'll help you out I think it'll be a good exercise for you it doesn't have to be super elaborate you could take 20 minutes and probably knock out this one assignment here so I, th I think it would be useful for you because you know the Bible is telling us always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have well how do you do that this could be a means of you being prepared you've thought through it you know the hope that you have you know the the reason for the hope that you have now when that comes up in a conversation you're able to do apologetics you're able to give that reason for the hope that you have so that's assignment number one it's the being prepared assignment there's a second assignment and that's a personal ministry assignment and really what I want you to do is I want you to identify someone in your life that you can uh, engage in conversations with using the stuff that we've been doing all along in the leadership initiative how many of you guys are thinking about doing this assignment the second one okay some of you are cool uh, and if you are comfortable I'd be happy to read those um, if you you know you had like a hard copy or whatever if you let me read it I would read it and give you words of encouragement and any suggestions or anything like that then it'd also be cool to see um, you know how I can be praying for you guys as you're applying this stuff I mean I've got ideas of uh, you know your guys' friendships and I kind of think through how uh, certain people can influence other people in the youth group and I think through all of that but but I would love to see the specifics like Tiffany is doing is is ministering to this person and she's praying and thinking about how she can do that and then I know that so I can be praying as well so I think that this has a lot of potential now there are four parts and this this is actually an assignment that I borrowed from another person so as we get um, a little bit further into it I might be able to give you better explanation but part one would be the background you I, I want you to be able to write down your your relationship with the person and how you know them and what your friendship is like and what sorts of things you guys talk about and all those different pieces that would help um, me to understand uh, how you have a friendship with that person part number two is identifying with the person so what what you're doing is you're um, hopefully able to after asking lots of good questions and probing and trying to figure out what's going on with that individual you're able to put into into words what motivates what drives that person and uh, hopefully they would they would um, be able to read that and go you get me okay part number three is a bridge building and it's just looking for it's looking for really an, an on-ramp for spiritual conversation so uh, as you're wanting to do personal ministry you should be looking for a way that you can bring up a conversation about spiritual things so you're looking for maybe items of common grace you're looking at your friends and some of the things that they do that you can you can say confidently this is the hand of God in your life this is God has wired you in such a way that that you do this and and it's pleasing to God and it's an on-ramp hopefully for conversations of spiritual things part number four is challenge what what is the word that you're going to bring to that person that is going to minister to them okay what what is the particular challenge that you feel like god is wanting to say to this person you are you are being used of god as a mouthpiece so if god okay think about it this way if god were to sit down with that individual what would god want to say to that person and it would have to be I mean it would definitely be very specific and very appropriate and it would have a certain tone and it would have a certain you know desired outcome those are those are all things that you should be thinking through as you are going to be used of God to do that so um, later on in, in first Peter it says those who speak should speak as if 
saying the very words of God. That's what you want to do. You want to challenge the individual uh, using what you have prayerfully considered and what you believe God has laid on your heart for that individual. So uh, that's assignment number two, the personal ministry assignment. And I think that it will be very helpful for you. Okay, we did personal ministry for seven weeks. Um, actually, nine weeks if we count the weeks that we didn't meet, but we, uh, we had off. But what we talked about from Paul Tripp's book was a lifestyle of being an ambassador from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20. And we said that there were four different aspects of an ambassador. The one, number one, was love. That was the idea of being willing to step into a person's life, uh, to incarnate the love of Christ, being willing to meet people where they're at, and, um, and, and accept them with an agenda. So, love is necessary for you to be good at, at personal ministry. You've actually got to care about people. So the person that you want to help, you should be praying that God would give you His heart for them. Okay, And remember, Jesus is our example. His love for us compelled Him to not grasp equality with God. This is Philippians 2. But He became humble and obedient and he became a servant and and he 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 in he came and he lived in our shoes to rescue us now your ministry should look like that that when you look at somebody and you look on them with love you're willing to enter into their life you're willing to get messy you're willing to be humiliated you're willing to meet them where they're at for their good because that's what God did for us. Number two, we should know people. We can't, uh, Paul Tripp says, we prefer to lob hand, gra hand grenades of truth into people's lives as opposed to doing the messy thing of coming into their life and being patient and listening. And that's not love. What we need to do is we need to be willing to ask questions. We need to be willing to sit with people and listen to them and and uh, ho hopefully uncover what's going on in their hearts. And that takes work and time and energy. So we want to know people. So we know people by asking good questions. And we should always be thinking through, what do I not know yet? Okay? What, what, is, what do I still, what am I missing still? So you're kind of a, a people interrogator. You're a detective. <coughs> but you're not doing it in a way that's abrasive. You're doing it in a way that's hopefully gracious and loving because you're trying to help uh, understand what's going on with the individual that you want to minister to. Then we said that a good helper speaks and um, that's, that's that communication piece that we're going, we're going to be used by God to communicate to other people. We said that our communication needs grace and truth. And uh, again, we need both of those different pieces as we seek to communicate to other people. So, on the one hand, our speech should be very full of grace, a willingness to identify with where people at, are at, a tone and a body language that communicates understanding and sympathy and all of that. But we also need to confront. God calls us to be... Uh, people who bring truth to bear on people's lives. And we need to show them where they fall short of God's glory, where they um, need change and all of those different things. So we have both grace and truth in our communication. The problem that we, that we talked about for two weeks in a row was when we overemphasize one or the other. We know people who are very gracious, who people love to talk to, they love to share information with, they love to even share their struggles with. But if, if all they've got is grace, then they never move somebody forward. They never uh, challenge them or encourage them. They're, they're gracious, but they're at times overly gracious. And, and that can be harmful. And, and then we know people who are overly truth tellers. And, and they love to challenge people and they love to bring truth to bear, but they do it in a way that 
is abrasive and because they don't have any grace, uh, people don't like to listen to them. Yeah, what they're saying might be totally true, but most people are going to distance themselves from people who are always bringing truth without grace. So we want to be careful that we, as ministers of the gospel, have both of those components in our lives, both grace and truth. Then that final piece is um, do, doing. Um, and that is, the, the idea is, change hasn't happened until change happens. Okay? So, when we're trying to help somebody, when we've had that conversation, when we've spoken, when we've challenged, when, when we've graciously brought truth, that's not the end. The end is when they reflect Christ. And so, a good minister of the gospel, a good uh, people helper, is willing to have that patience and, and that um, energy to go the distance. So, uh, Tripp says it this way, we confuse growth and insight with genuine life change. So it's like once we've given them the, the information, we feel like we're done. But the truth is, that's not, that's not change until they've taken the truth of God and applied it to their lives. So, number one, we want to establish a personal ministry agenda. Um, Basically, what we want to do is we, we want to come up with a strategy for what God might be doing in their lives. Okay? So we're, we're looking for what is, God, what is God's goal for this individual? Not my goal. You know, we've all got our own wills and we, you know, especially people that we have relationships with, we want them to do certain things because it would be better for us. That's not our personal ministry agenda. Our personal ministry agenda is... What does God want to do? Okay? So, um, when you think of maybe a family member or some, your friend, somebody who's close to you, you should be humble enough to recognize it might not be what you want. God's design for them, God's goal for them, might be totally different. So, so what we want to do is we want to establish that personal ministry agenda. We want to, number two, clarify responsibility and basically what we're doing there is we're helping ourselves and the person that we're ministering to we're helping them to to understand what it is that they should be doing what it is that falls into the category of this is on you you have to do these things now there are some circles there uh, that kind of represent different uh, levels of responsibility so on the on the far left there's an area of concern, and that would be kind of that personal ministry agenda. What, what do we hope to see happen? Now, within that, we should be able to clarify, now, these are, this is your responsibility. These are things you need to do. And, and we want to help people to know that so they know, all right, this is what I should be. These are action steps that I can take. Now, that would be appropriate. Now, there's, there's stuff that's outside of our control that maybe falls into the domain of, this is God's, this is God's um, doing. Okay? So there are certain things you need to do, certain things that God is doing. Let's make sure that we understand the difference between the two. The problem is, is that sometimes people, people are overly responsible. And you can see that in that second circle where they begin to take on all sorts of things. And, and that's, that's a lack of trust in God. And that's a, really, that's, that's a lack of belief. And so we begin to think, I'm in, I'm in control of my life and I've got to do all these different things. And that produces anxiety and worry and, and all sorts of different problems. And even discouragement when, when, we, when change doesn't happen as fast as we hope because we're saying, I'm not doing it right. I'm, and we're taking on all this extra Responsibility. So we want to clarify. We want people to know what is their responsibility, what is God doing in the midst of it, and uh, help them to trust and believe in the areas that they don't actually have control over, and then help them to take action on the things that, that are their responsibility. Now, some people, that third circle, they're just confused. They don't even know where to begin. 
So we want to help them. And then there's, a, there's even a fourth way of looking at it, which is uh, if you were to draw another one, you could make the circle for responsibility very, very small. Sometimes people think, oh, it's no worries. God's, gonna, God's got this taken care of. And we need to go, no, there's more to it than, than just that. There are certain things that you should be doing differently. And you're getting these results because you're not taking action for certain things that, that God is calling you to do. Does that make sense? So there's different uh, ways that people respond to the personal ministry agenda. We want to clarify what's healthy and what's unhealthy. Number three, we, as we're helping people, we want to instill identity in Christ. We want to help people recognize who they are in Christ. And Paul Tripp talks about identity amnesia, which is what we all suffer from. We, I'm in Christ, but I forget that. Okay. So if, if I were living my life and operating on that truth that I am in Christ, I would have confidence and security and swagger, all these different things, right? But I forget that. And so I'm prone to fear, worry, unrest, all those different things. Now the same is true of you and the same is true of the people that you want to help. And so what we need to do is we need to constantly march that truth in front of them and remind people of who, who they are in Christ. You are a child of God. You are loved. You are accepted. And help them to recognize that because that's going to be a truth that helps them to, to grow. Then number four, we want to provide accountability. Provide accountability, which is basically not just giving them a game plan, but helping them to carry it out. Just like if, if you know, it's the beginning of the year, a lot of people have different goals and ambitions maybe of working out and all those other things. That's great, but, but a lot of times people need a, a coach to keep them accountable. Do, I'm going to eat this way, I'm going to work out this much. Those are good an intentions, but how are you going to see that through? How are you going to actually do that? And um, the same is true of spiritual training. Uh, we might have good intentions. People might say, yeah, I'm going to change. I'm, I, I want to grow in this way. I want to trust God more. I want to uh, be more confident. And then that's a good intention. What, what we can do as helpers is we can provide accountability. How are you going to do that? How are we going to check in to make sure that that's happening? We, we can provide accountability for people in those different ways in order to help them do what God is calling them to do. Okay? Any questions or comments? That's all been reviewed. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, so, any, any questions or comments? Anything that stands out as particularly helpful? All right, then let's move on. Um, all right, apologetics. Um, let's go ahead. We'll look at the word for it, and that's um, letter B on your outline. It's the Greek word, and it means a defense, a reasoned case proving the innocence of an accused person in court or a demonstration of the correctness of an argument or belief. Okay, That's what... The word means. That, that's coming from this book right here. I'll be real with you guys. I haven't had uh, any training in this stuff. So like, I'm leaning pretty heavily on, on this book right here. Uh, Mere Apologetics by Alistair McGrath. And you know, the idea is um, kind of an overview and basics of, of apologetics. So uh, he, he, when he gives that definition... He's talking about kind of giving the, the reasoning and, uh, and showing or demonstrating the correctness of our, of our belief. So that Greek word, when you think of it in terms of Christianity and apologetics, you know, Christian apologetics, what we're saying is, is that we want to show or demonstrate the correctness of faith. 
and we want to give explanation to why it makes sense. That's what we're doing when we engage in apologetics. Now, what I want to do is I want to take you to a couple different passages so we can explore this idea together. If you've got a Bible or you can find one near you, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter three. <clears throat> and we're going to read verses fourteen through sixteen. So I'll give you just a moment to get there. So it says this first Peter three, starting in verse fourteen. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an, to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that, you, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. All right, look over that again. <clears throat> this is a passage that definitely gets at the nature of apologetics. There are a few things that I think we need to call our attention to. What, is, what does this say about hope? What does this passage teach us about hope? Yeah, yeah. It, it shows us um, how to defend the hope that we have. So, you, you know, on your outlines, if you're looking at the different categories that I've kind of set down there, um, as far as reasoning, you can, you can talk about how this passage shows us the importance of giving a defense for the hope that you have. So we need to be able to give defense to explain to somebody why we believe what we believe. What else does this show us? Uh, what else does this passage show us about hope or our attitude or our way of life? Those other categories we've got down there. What other insights do you guys see from there? Go ahead. Um, it talks about like when you're persecuted, you're blessed because like your hope is so strong that others like um, doubt isn't going to affect you. And so it's like you guys an attitude. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you're persecuted, the context is persecution. The context is uh, people are going to mistreat you and try to harm you and you're suffering for doing what's right, but you have a hope that's unshakable. Um, that, that's important, you know, that we recognize what Christianity ultimately gets at it. It's helping us to see that our hope is um, unshakable in Christ. Any, what else? What else does it teach us about our hope? What is our hope fixed in? Like, what is the object of our hope? Maybe in the, that first verse, in verse 14. Or 15. Go ahead, Grace. Is it just anyone who uh, questions you, basically? Yeah, any, anyone who questions you, 
we should be able to give that reason for the hope that we have. And uh, I, think, I think that it's important to note that our hope is we're setting apart Christ as our Lord. That we're setting apart Christ as Lord. He is our hope. He is, he is the object of our hope. He's what we fix our eyes on and, and what we believe in and what we long for is Him. Um, so our hope is, I would say, in Christ. That having that hope in Christ means that we don't have to fear um, says, do not fear what they fear. Uh, do not be frightened. Set apart Christ as Lord. Then um, it says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone. So we're giving our reasoning. Um, we're giving kind of the motivation of why we believe in Christ as Lord. And that's what we should be doing in apologetics. We're, we're explaining to people. What about the attitude of the apologist? What, what should our attitudes be? Yeah, yeah, gentleness and respect. So, a lot of times we think about apologetics as this debate. And you've got friends at school and they come at you with all these hard questions about, about God and about creation and about suffering and evil and all of that. And, and we think through, we've got we've to come back at them with all the right answers. And we've got we've to prove to them why they're wrong and we're right. That is not the goal of apologetics. The goal is not to win arguments, it's to win people. And so your attitude is very important. Do this with gentleness and respect. So as you talk to another person who could be very confrontational, very abrasive, very condescending towards Christianity, your attitude is always going to be the same gentleness and respect. Okay, So hopefully um, you can be praying for that attitude. What about the way of life? What does it say about the way of life of an apologist? Go ahead. Just having the dignity in Christ like always trying to reflect what he did. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. Having the behavior of Christ. Having a way of life that is above reproach. Living in a way that, that reflects Jesus himself. So that way when people speak maliciously against you or your beliefs, they don't have any dirt on you, okay? Because you're living in a way that is um, basically commending Christ to them. So that's important. So it's not just arguments. It's not just trying to give reasoning, which is part of apologetics, but it's also attitude. It's also gentleness and respect. And it's also a way of life that is going to um, be helpful in um, letting people know the nature of faith. Let me take you to one more example. Turn with me to Acts. I read this this morning. Uh, Acts chapter 6. Uh, we'll, we'll look at an example of good apologetics. So, Acts chapter 6. Um, this is Stephen. He's one of, the, one of the guys who was chosen to do ministry, and he was chosen because of the, whole, because of the Holy Spirit in him and his gifting. But it says this, starting in verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen. Okay, you see the context here? They're trying to prove Stephen wrong. They're trying to show that his faith is silly. It's ridiculous. Okay, that's, that's what we're talking about. You're going to go to school. People are going to argue with you about faith and whether or not you are right. And so Stephen is engaging in apologetics here, verse 10. But they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, 
We've heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Okay, do you see the, the parallels here? That Stephen is engaging in apologetics and what he's able to do is he's not fearful because he has a certain hope in Christ as Lord and so when they are coming at him and arguing with him, he has confidence. So number one, as apologists, we need confidence in Christ. Then uh, he's able to give the reason for the hope that he has. He's able to explain because he's full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. So he's able to do apologetics just the way that Peter talks about. He's, he's defending the faith. His attitude, think about this, his attitude is gracious. We don't see him like getting angry with this people even though they're bringing false accusations against him. He's got a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against him uh, can see his good behavior in Christ and be ashamed of their slander. All those pieces from 1 Peter 3, 14 through 16 are there. Stephen is doing apologetics in the way that Peter is, is instructing us. So he's, Stephen is giving us an example of what that looks like. When people come at us arguing about faith, we should do it. We should be able to explain our, our faith in Christ. We should do it without fear or worry of what they might think. We should do it with gentleness and respect. And we should do it with an attitude and behavior that reflects Christ's likeness so that they, they could look on us and they could see the face of an angel, the Holy Spirit in us, and, our, and all those different pieces. Does that make sense? Is that helpful to see it as an, as an example in Scripture? So, here are some different themes within apologetics. Letter A, this is from Mere Apologetics, this book right here. Uh, Alistair McGrath says, um, theme number one would be defending. Letter A, defending. So what we're doing is we're giving explanation to concerns. It's uh, def defense is is kind of reactive. So, for an example, somebody says, "I don't think that science and and scripture go together. I think they're in conflict." Well, we need to be able to give it a, a defense that makes sense. We're reacting to a concern that somebody has, and we're showing them how truth works. So, uh, it's kind of reactive in nature, but we need, to be, we need to be giving honest and gracious answers. So, we need to be able to help people uh, make better sense of the world than, than other options. So, it's showing the reasonableness of faith. So, letter B, the second theme of apologetics is commending. Okay, commending. And what that means is that we want people to see the attractiveness, the beauty of Christ. So, it's, tr it's a positive dimension of apologetics. We're trying to set forth a, basically the treasure. We're saying, here is something so valuable. And we're commending it to people and we're showing them why it's valuable. Here, here is why faith in Christ is is awesome. And you're showing them the reasons behind that. Uh, you're providing better answers than what alternative worldviews can. Okay, So we're, we want to commend people to believe in, in Christianity because it's an attractive truth. It makes sense of the world that we live in. And then it's answering questions like, is it true? And will it work? And so what we're doing is we're showing people how it, how it is true, how it fits together, and then how it works. What does it do to a person when they believe these truths? Well, 
doesn't mean that their life is perfect, but they have resources available to them that make life livable. Okay? They can go, people who are Christians can go through stuff with grace because they understand the world that God has made and they understand the provision that Christ is for them. So, we're commending. Uh, then the third element of apologetics is translating. And what we want to do here is we want to make the Christian faith accessible. So translation really has to do with trying to think through where are the people that I'm helping, where are they at? And how can I communicate this truth in a way that's going, going to be sensible to them? So, so as an apologist, what we have the responsibility of doing is making sure that we're giving explanation to the stuff that we're talking about. And we're helping them to, um, to, to really understand Christianity. So an example that, that uh, Alistair McGrath gives is justification. Okay? Justification is a big theme in, in the Bible. The problem is, when people hear that word, what they might think about is proving themselves right. You know, like, I'm justified. I, di I did what I should have done. I did it, you know. Uh, the circumstances dictated to me that this is what I should have done. I'm justified. I'm cool. That's not justification by faith. So we need to explain that. Or another idea that people might have when we use that word is on a piece of paper. It, if it's justified, the margins are, are correct, okay? That's not what we're talking about. So we need to translate to people the concepts that we want them to understand. It means that we have to use language that is accessible to them. And we need to give explanation to any words that might be confusing to them. So, what, what we need to do as apologists is think through our language and our vocabulary and think through how we can speak in a way that uh, is going to make sense of the faith. Now, I'm not saying that we should do away with words like justification or propitiation or all these biblical terms, sanctification. I'm not saying like never use them, but when we do, we need to explain what they mean. So that way when we're talking to our friends, uh, we, can we can speak to them in a way that they understand. Think about Jesus. He was great at translation. He took big concepts, big Christian concepts, and then he taught them in parables. Okay? It's like a field. It's like a farmer sowing seeds. He was translating to the people the kingdom of God. And he was using non-technical language so that way the people that were hearing him could understand. He always spoke in parables. So that way people could understand. Well, in some cases, he hid the meaning from them. But, but he, he was great at translating Christian truths to the people. And that's what we need to do as well. We need to make sure that we use language that's going to help the people that we're talking to understand. Now, <clears throat> there's a, there's, it's, I think it's a good idea to just look briefly at the difference between apologetics and evangelism. Like we've said, apologetics removes those obstacles to faith, whereas evangelism is inviting people to personally respond. So you can see the difference. It's, it, they're similar, and they're complementary. So you could be having a conversation with somebody, and it could be apologetic and evangelistic at the same time. But I just want you to recognize the slight difference between the two. Uh, apologetics is conversational, where evangelism is invitational. So what you're doing on the one hand with apologetics is you're trying to uh, help people understand Christianity. Evangelism is... Now that you understand, believe, come, accept. Uh, it's kind of, McGrath gives the, the example of the wedding feast of Christ. Apologetics would be, ex, would be explaining, there's a party, and it's going to be awesome. And it's a wedding party, it's the supper, wedding supper of the Lamb, and it is incredible. That's all apologetics because it's explaining that reality. Evangelism is, you're invited. Come. And that's what we want to do with our friends. We don't just want to explain Christianity. We, we want to invite them to respond to it. So, any questions about this stuff?
I think as we get into this more, um, hopefully it'll be pretty helpful to you guys. And uh, maybe if there's specific questions of apologetics, we can stuff too. This is going. This stuff is going to help us with the art form of doing apologetics. But but maybe if you guys want, we could look at some very particular struggles that people have, and uh, we can use some other resources as well to try to prepare us. So if you have friends that have obstacles that you can think of, like I've got a friend who doesn't believe in Christianity because of this, uh, maybe it'd be a good idea for us together to work through. How do, we, how do we interact with that? So um, just let me know of, of ways that I can hopefully help us uh, more in the coming weeks. Well, let's pray right now. God, thank you so much for just what you're doing with this group right here. And God, I pray, please, that you would use our time together and that you would wield it in their lives in a in a mighty way, God. I think about these students right here and I think about um, just what they can what they can do with the rest of their lives and how they can serve you. And I pray that the leadership initiative has been um, helpful for them and encouraging for them. And I pray that they would use these concepts and their their entire lives would be marked by fruitfulness because of the time that we've spent together here. So Holy Spirit, do your work in us and uh, help us to be m excellent ministers of the gospel. Help us to defend the faith well and do it with gentleness and respect and help our behavior to reflect Christ's likeness and, and just help us, God, to um, show people your Son. And so we pray in His name. Amen.